with with a lot of our Christmas music, we focus so much on the humanity of Christ, which is great. Um, but this one draws us back to remember that while He is human, He's also divine, and mm-hmm. and so I like I like that it balances that to a bit mm-hmm. to an extent. Mm-hmm. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Him Partial, the podcast where we talk all things church music. I'm Cara Devereaux. And I'm Monet Funka. And today we will be talking to Kenny and Claire Music. They're here to tell us about the Advent hymn, Let All Mortal Flesh Keep Silence, plus the adventures of being a married music duo. But first, Advent is here. So if you're a long-term Hymn Partial listener, you know that we love this season. Don't miss out on all the goodies we have in store for you. Subscribe to our channel if you're watching on YouTube and follow us on Instagram where you'll be getting daily, that's right, daily goodies as we count down to Christmas. Yes, and if you're listening to us for the first time or for some odd reason you have yet to join the Hymn Partial family, you can find all of our info at hymnpartial.com. There you can sign up for our free weekly newsletter. You can become a Kofi member and support us financially. This week, subscribers get first access to our bonus question where we ask Kenny and Claire about the weird aversion to liturgy in some Christian circles. Yeah, I absolutely love their answer. It completely changed my way of thinking on liturgy and what it is and what it's supposed to do. So don't miss it. Yeah, and it really opened up a really large conversation that we're probably going to have to get into in future episodes. But subscribers get to see it first. And if you're not a subscriber and you're watching this, who knows when you get to see that video. We release it as and when, and as and when is when we remember it. <laughs> yeah, bear in mind, December is a very busy season, yeah. so we may not remember to release bonus clips to the public, so if you want them, you need to sign up. Yeah, that's that's definitely true. So uh, we recorded this episode um, a few months ago before Kenny and Claire went on tour. Uh, they were actually at the start of their tour, so you could see them in their camper van as they do this recording. And so the internet's a little bit um, spotty, but I think you can make out like 95% of what they're saying and it's really, really good because I I feel like you learn about an artist and you, you get their background and you, and you want them on the show and then they, they come on and every single time they, they just blow our minds with how much they know. And they are just such a knowledgeable couple. They know so, so much and they know a lot about this hymn, which I'm really excited to get into. So Cara's going to read their bio and then we will play the interview for you. Kenny and Claire are a husband and wife folk Americana duo based in Nashville, Tennessee. They write worship songs and rewrite hymns to encourage the church with lyrics and music that contain deep doctrinal truths and are firmly rooted in scripture. Their debut project, Are You Weary, is a five song EP doctrinally rich and biblically grounded hymns that have mostly fallen out of use. They've updated the language, rewritten the melodies, and rearranged the music to better highlight the lyrics for modern worship. They spent the last year touring across the country in an effort to bring these songs back to the church. Kenny and Claire, welcome to the show. Thank you. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having us. We were just saying off camera that you guys are in your, in your, is it a motor home? Uh, yeah. You're traveling, yeah. You're traveling camper, you're traveling home, and I'm just like admiring it from this, <laughs> with envy, Lord, pray for my soul, uh, <laughs> because it's so cool. So in That's the middle of touring, just... Not very large, though. <laughs> large enough. It's got, it's got hey. what you need, right? <laughs> yeah. And is it one that's pulled by like a truck, or is it, or is it drive itself? Does it have its own... Yeah, we, we pull it with our truck, and then in the back of the truck, we have all of our sound equipment for shows and, and things like that. That's cool. I think I saw it on the Rabbit Room on Facebook, maybe, and also on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> just saying. She just saw it a few times, dozen times. Just a stalker, and, okay? Yeah, <laughs> she's, she's observing it. I got sidetracked immediately. Thank you so much for your time. We know you guys are really busy, and you're obviously in your camper because you're busy touring and 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 doing really cool things. Let's talk about you. Let's let's talk. Let's introduce folks who might not know who you are. Tell us who you are. Well, we are Kenny. Yang. <laughs> He's Kenny. Yang. We if are. You can't tell who's who. <laughs> We're a folk Americana. Fans, we write music for the church. Um, our first project that we did was an album of rewritten hymns. And these are hymns that have mostly fallen out of use in the church that we've rewritten to try to bring them back 
to the church so that these truths within them will continue to be sung. And it's also mm-hmm. a really fun way, we feel like, to sing along with the church that's gone before, with the saints that have gone before. But we're continuing these songs on now. And the goal is, you know, there's there's some really good theology that's in these mm-hmm. hymns. Um, whether it's melody or word usage, they're not likely to be used in their current form. But our goal is mm-hmm. to get that theology itself back into the the worship music of the church because it probably contains elements that aren't going to be written in 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 a modern song necessarily. Uh, it's just mm-hmm. a good way to be reminded of things that our society and era may not appreciate but need to hear anyway. Mm-hmm. Yep, that's great. Um, I was we were talking about it. We we're saying we can't think of many husbands and wife duos in the music industry. So it's really cool that you guys get to do that together. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's an adventure. <laughs> now nah, we we love it. Um, it's a part of what we've done together since we've met. We met uh, seventeen, yeah, seventeen years ago. Now we met playing music when you were, when you were children. Yeah, very very we were young. Very very young. I <laughs> looked a lot like a child back then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the second night that I met him, I asked him to be in my band. Nice. And nice. and then and that was about it. That was for a little while, yeah. <laughs> and then we've been playing the music music together since. Yeah. Mm. You know, we we have a lot of friends in the in, in the music community in Nashville and you know, we see the struggles that that some have because they're traveling but their significant other has mm. Mm-hmm. who has to be at home trying to fit schedules for touring and everything is really hard. I, I love that we can do it together as a family. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it keeps us from rushing so much yeah. uh, because together, you know, we're not trying mm-hmm. to get home to see each other. So much. Mm-hmm. It's, it's got its perks. It's really, yeah. really helpful. It requires a lot of communication. <laughs> <laughs> it <does. laughs> but it's been good. And I like how um, it plays off of each other's strengths and weaknesses there are things that he does and takes care of concerning the music that i don't and vice versa and it evens out pretty well so i'm just thankful for the lord's grace in that Um, yeah Yeah, you guys complement each other in marriage and in music i'm sure you can write a book (laughs) (laughs) you could um call it something about harmony oh Oh, yes harmony in marriage and music written by kenny and claire um Say it again. Oh, I said work through the dissonance. <laughs> oh, I love oh, it. Nice. Yes. We might have to talk about that offline. Um. <laughs> <laughs> that is now copyrighted. No one can steal that. <laughs> okay. So before the show, we asked you to share one of your favorite songs for Advent. And you said you both love Let All Mortal Flesh Keep Silence. So that's not one of the better known ones. So can you tell us like how you came to know and enjoy the song and what sort of draws you to it at Advent? Do you want to start? Oh, well, um, Kenny brought it to my attention, or to the front of my attention, maybe two years ago when we were looking at songs to share and lead our church in um, at Christmas time. And it let all mortal flesh keep silent it was a song that I had always seen in the hymn book growing up, but we actually never really sung it in our church. Or if we did, it didn't stand out and I didn't quite remember it, but I love it now because I love, I don't, not only the tune, the tune is beautiful, but what I love about it is that it brings reverence and awe in looking to Jesus when he came in his birth. And then the last verse is um, looking towards um, his return when he reigns. Mm-hmm. I mean, reign now, but um, mm-hmm. it's not just looking towards his birth only, but also just honoring mm-hmm. him through all, all eternity. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I was introduced to the Fernando Ortega uh, rendition of it mm-hmm. back then. I heard it and, and uh, when I heard it, I was just like, we have to do this song. This thing is really powerful, <laughs> you know. Yeah. It is a beautiful yeah. song. I mean, we we were playing it for my son uh, this week. and He was mesmerized. Yeah, he's a year and a half. 
Yeah. And as soon as it came on, it was like a, a small ensemble that was singing it a cappella. Mm. And he just kind of like turned and stared at the speaker like in awe, like, wow. Like, so it is a really beautiful like arrangement, the one mm. we were listening to. I the words are really one of the cool well. things is that, you know, with with a lot of our Christmas music, we focus so much on the humanity of Christ, which is great. Um, but this one draws us back to remember that while he is human, he's also divine. And, mm-hmm. and so I like I like that it balanced that to a bit, mm-hmm. to an extent. Mm-hmm. This is, I, I mean, I didn't know this until I looked it up, but this is actually a surprisingly old, mm-hmm. old hymn. Um, uh, can you tell us the history of it? Like who wrote it and how it's been adopted by different traditions through the years? Yeah, so um, it's mostly used in the Greek Orthodox Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church. Uh, the Greek name is Sigisato uh, Pasa Sarx Brotia, um, but it was it was originally in the the um, Liturgy of Saint James, which is used in Jerusalem, the Syriac Church, and that that liturgy is from the fourth century. Um, but there there's research that that seems to suggest that the song itself came before that liturgy and mm-hmm. was likely written around 275 AD. Um, so it's really old in that regard. Mm-hmm. Um, it, wasn't brought, it wasn't brought to English until uh, Gerard Moultrie did in 1864. And then it was just the, it was just, uh, the, the words we have. And then there was a man named Ralph Vaughn Williams who oh, put yeah. the words to a friend, uh, melody party which is from it's a medieval french melody and so he, he mm-hmm. put those two together um and and i couldn't get a date for that but i know that williams died in 1950 so this would have been like the end of the 1800s the beginning of the 1900s when we have it in the form that we know it from our hymnals and i will say historically i know it's been used as a communion hymn mm-hmm. personally we love to use as a call to worship um, mm-hmm. him to focus on majesty. Yeah, it's really great as a call Christ. to worship during the Advent season. Uh, mm-hmm. In the in the um, in the Orthodox traditions, it tends to be used on uh, the Saturday after the Holy Saturday after the crucifixion um, during the communion portion. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it has also been used for um, Advent, of course, in those traditions as well. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. It's, um, it never ceases to amaze me how long some hymns histories are. Like, mm-hmm. cause they didn't, obviously not everything's written in English. Um, but it's amazing that they've lasted so long. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. You have yeah. to think that there's something that is, uh, that is quality about a hymn that has lasted over centuries, millennia or, almost. Or at least something very, very true. Yes, yeah. and in oh, different yeah. languages and mm-hmm. different traditions, like there's some. I mean, because you know, Christ came and he died, so like that was, you know, when he was born, that was day one of worshiping him, and then since then, there's been so many days to worship him. So like to have a hymn that's really close to when he was walking this earth, um, still being sung today like there's something really powerful about that maybe i can't really articulate so, it but yeah on our album we have a song are you weary and mm-hmm. it was also from that greek tradition mm-hmm. written in seven that one was written in 700 okay. um but we like to talk about how you know even though the song has different forms over the eras we're still singing the same words and you kind of get yeah. that mm-hmm. picture of the great out of witnesses from mm-hmm. hebrews that's cheering on to cast off the weight of sin they've sung these songs too and they finished well. And so it's just that encouragement that we're singing along, not just with our, our local community of faith, but the community of faith throughout history as well. Yeah. Uh, when we kind of songs. Amen. Yeah, <laughs> it's great. And it just, yeah, it gives you a, a, a wider kind of understanding of the church. Mm-hmm. Like there's church, small C, which is your local body of believers. And then there's like the church, big C, Mm -hmm. which spans not just the world, but history. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I really liked, are you weary? That was a really good one. (laughs) Yeah. Um, 
So, Shameless plug. Go check out the album. <laughs> yeah. Go listen to it, guys. Like, it's really good. So, um, what are some of the Bible verses his hymn is based on? And um, would you mind reading some of those for us? Yeah. So, I figured I, I would read one and then Claire has one too. Uh, but one that's front of mind is Habakkuk chapter 2. Um, mm-hmm. it, it, the Really, the verse is verse 20. But it kind of is in a context of idolatry. And so I really like starting in verse 18 and getting down to verse 20. Mm. But he says, uh, what prophet is an idol when its maker has shaped it? A metal image, a teacher of lies for its maker trusts in his own creation. When he makes speechless idols, woe to him who says to a wooden thing, awake or to a silent stone arise. Can this teach? Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and there is no breath in it at all. Mm. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. And so you get that contradiction, that, that um, you know, distinction between you're making all these things and you're worshiping them and they, they, they're silent. They can't speak. Mm. But mm. here's the one that can, and you are the one that needs to be silent before him. Mm. Um, but I just, I love the distinction there, mm. um, getting at some of the issues of the human heart in a lot of different ways. Every time we sing the last verse of let all mortal flesh keep silent, Isaiah six comes to mind. And it says in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple above him stood the the seraphim. Each had six wings with two. He covered his face and with two, he covered his feet and with two, he flew. And one called to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Mm. Amen. And actually what's cool about tying that to this hymn is that John tells us in his gospel that what Isaiah Isaiah sees is Jesus on his throne in Mm -hmm. that, in that passage. That's really cool. We should read the lyrics, don't you think? Yeah. You want me to pull them up? Pull them up. I'm just thinking, like, we're talking about them and we're talking about the verses Mm -hmm. that are related to them, but... um, I love how you said earlier, and hearing those verses that you just read, that this is a great call to worship, and, you know, we're actually starting (coughs) um, kind of like our Advent season with this hymn. We're starting it day one, December 1st, like everybody let's sing this together. And that's just like a perfect, you know, God's providence has brought that hymn on this day together um, as a perfect call to worship to say, let's actually um, keep silent, even though we're obviously going to be singing before the throne of God and like, and, and actually take him in and actually see him for who he is. So it's really lovely. You got the lyrics? Yeah. All right. Four verses. Yes. I've got the right one. Yeah. Okay. I just don't want to miss any because it's good. (laughs) So the lyrics are, let all mortal flesh keep silence and with fear and trembling stand. Ponder nothing earthly minded for with his blessing in his hand, Christ our God to earth descending comes our homage to command. King of Kings, yet born of Mary, as of old on earth he stood, Lord of Lords and human likeness in the body and the blood. He will give to all the faithful his own self for heavenly food. Rank on rank, the host of heaven spreads its vanguard on the way. As the light from light descending from the realms of endless day comes the powers of hells to vanquish as the darkness clears away. At his feet, the six-winged seraph, cherubim with sleepless eye, veil their faces to the presence as with ceaseless voice they cry, Hallelujah, 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 Lord Most High. It's good. It's great. It's great lyrics. I mean, Mm -hmm. I think you've you've given us like so much to chew on in terms of what a beautiful song this is and the history of it and the richness of it, thinking about the Advent season. Why don't a lot of Protestant churches sing this hymn? Is that just, is that biased? Is that like me in my corner of the of I have the never earth? sung it and I've been in a few different Protestant denomination-y yeah. things. Why do, why do you my- think? I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> my opinion, 
I wonder if that's not because perhaps because of the language a bit, like the word Mm -hmm. homage, that's not one we use a lot. When I had Mm -hmm. to look up, because I needed to, and it's just paying honor um, Mm -hmm. is is what it means. Or vanguard. Or vanguard. Mm -hmm. We We don't fight with or, but that's that's the leading element of an army, you know. But at the same time, I think that using some of that language can in, help us learn and challenge us to grow. Um, and those who lead it can help also explain, hey, this is what we mean when we're saying these words. Mm-hmm. I, I think part of it too um, is th- the form that we have in our hymnals didn't really come around till the you know, possibly the early 1900s. And so even though it's been used in other uh, traditions, um, it really hasn't been available to our tradition as much. Mm -hmm. Um, And also the tendency to lean on more chipper, more cheerful, um, you know, Christmas things. I mean, our, our, at least in the American tradition, we want to be happy a lot. And so the Mm -hmm. more somber, the the more slow we, we tend to avoid them or we have historically, I think we're getting back towards it now, yeah. but historically we did away from that. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I really do think so. I mean, we, we it's come up so much and this is just because we're just dipping our toe into the hymn world. I didn't grow up singing <laughs> hymns. You know, my exposure to the hymn world is like a handful of years. Um, and it's come up a lot that um, in the West, maybe even more specifically in the U.S., we don't know how to mourn. We don't know how to have that sobriety. We're, we're we don't the know same in the U.K. We're just yeah. like a stiff upper lip and all that. Like. Yeah. So it is nice to have a hymn that kind of has like this, like you said, somber kind of serious tone that is also obviously so beautiful I think maybe we don't know how to put those things together culturally to um so I'll give an example that has nothing to do with music we went to the Grand Canyon in 2019 and if you've ever been to the Grand Canyon it's one of those things where people are like oh, whatever it's a giant hole who cares and I'm like <laughs> no you have to go because there's something about standing at the edge of that canyon where you're just like in awe of it and, oh, it's, yeah. and it's, you almost can't even say that. People look at you like, were well, you some kind of weirdo? Like, yes, no, like it's, it's awesome. Like, you know, to sit there and it's serious. You just realize like your place in the world. Like it's one of these kind of, I don't know, existential things when you yeah. go to the Grand Canyon. Um, so maybe we don't like to sing in that way. It feels too, I don't know, incompatible with the way we, we practice our Christian faith. I don't know. You know, um, I think one thing that we have to kind of take into account when we talk about, you know, both Britain and here in America uh, struggling with mourning mm-hmm. is that um, I, I see it significantly changing around World War One and World War Two, And mm-hmm. I can't help but wonder if there was so much mourning and so much difficult, especially in America, we're coming off the Civil War, the war. I mean, there 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 are a hand Spanish American war like there's there's a lot of. Of, of death and mourning going on from 1800s into the early 1900s. And I'd almost wonder if because of all that shock and difficulty and mourning, if there wasn't a cultural shift to try to get away from it and to try to forget it and, and to mm-hmm. set it aside. And we now having, you know, all these years separated from that trauma are finally starting to get back to where we can get in touch culturally societally with these feelings and not have that in the background of our mind. It's, Hmm. I mean, it's a theory. I don't know, but. I mean, there was a lot more um, cynicism about a lot of things after the war as well. So I know in the UK, like there was a a kind of more openness about cultural Christianity. People were kind of like, after everything we've seen, like, we're done with this. We're not Mm. even pretending anymore. Mm. Um, So it's quite possible that, yeah, it's kind of a reaction of life is short and it's painful. So we're just going to ignore that and try and be happy. Mm. I will say that for those who aren't familiar with the song, it's in a minor Mm. key and Mm. often 
minor keys tend to sound sad, <laughs> but I feel like, <laughs> but in this, in this setting, I love how the minor key helps to promote reverence and mm-hmm. awe. Mm-hmm. And it makes you sit back and take in the beauty of what's being sung. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's my perspective on it. But I think like there's a place for a little bit of sadness in mm-hmm. the joy at Christmas because sure, it's joyful. This is like, this is God mm-hmm. come in flesh. That's amazing. That's wonderful. And he's come to save us, mm-hmm. but he's going to die. And I think yeah. knowing that, although yes, he ri- rises again, knowing that he's still got to go through all of that. Mm-hmm. Like there is that little undercurrent of mm-hmm. this is wonderful, but it's also kind of bittersweet. Mm-hmm. Well, one thing we like to to focus on just with our music in general, and it may be one of the reasons we're kind of drawn to this hymn, mm-hmm. is um, we like to think of the, the the music we write and and the way we perform as 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 seeing these glorious truths about who God is, the glorious mm-hmm. wonder of who He is and what He has done for His people, mm-hmm. in light of the fact that we still live in a sinful world, mm-hmm. and so we we in our music want a hint of that mourning, a hint of that struggle, even though we're talking about wonderful things um, yeah. because we, we should have a continual longing for the kingdom to come in its fullness. Yes. Um, and I think that it, it helps with that to think, mm-hmm. you know, this isn't going to be the way it's always going to be, but for now yeah. it's hard. I mean, we're not just putting it under a rug. We're not just ignoring it. Um, yeah. and, and I think that that's one of the reasons we don't lament. Well, like you're saying, mm-hmm. we have a tendency to hide it. Um, mm-hmm. And that's something we like to kind of keep Lord willing uh, front and center in our music as well. Mm-hmm. I think well, that. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was saying, I think that in light of Christmas and joy at Christmas, that I would argue that in, in order to understand our joy and what it is about, that first we have to see the weariness of this world, mm-hmm. or maybe not just see it. I think we all see it, but. Mm-hmm. In a sense of um, seeing the weariness, admitting the weariness, um, but then in light of that, seeing um, the joy that God has come to earth mm-hmm. um, and in the gospel that he lived a perfect life, took the punishment mm-hmm. for our sin, now with God forever and ever, um, and that he is going to come back. So we mm-hmm. feel the weariness of this we see now but also the joy and hope that he came once he promised it he came he promised he's coming again Mm -hmm. and there's joy there Mm -hmm. um a both and yeah yeah definitely yeah i think the knowing the the reality of the weariness makes the joy and the hope all the sweeter Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes yeah i was i was um i i I find myself in situations talking to a lot of different pastors. And, and I think one thing that I've, I've, I've heard consistently um, and it, it, it happened to me like when, early in my ministry, I didn't really think much of the coming kingdom or like mm. long for it in ways um, that I do now. And the reason for that is the struggle and suffering that I've had to walk with people through mm. the death that we've had to, through and you realize as a pastor you know every week you get calls and you're just like you know it would be really nice if this was done away with like Mm. this isn't going to be forever won't be um Mm. but just the weariness sets in after a while and you and you you long Mm. for the kingdom to come um in ways that are in ministry i find myself i didn't but you know as we face it and actually it's interesting uh martin luther he said that we cannot rightly interpret scripture until we have suffered. Um, hmm. That he says it's a key component to un- how to interpret scripture and understand what scripture is actually telling us. Um, so it's a good thing. That's why we should count it all joy when it comes. Yeah. Um, but it's a necessary part of life as well. Mm. We know that all too well, all too well. <laughs> Well, I think you have really encouraged me with this hymn, and uh, I hope our listeners are encouraged to listen to it and sing it 
this Advent season because there's a lot of depth here. Um, we're actually going to have you guys stick around for a bonus question that our subscribers get to hear first. But before we go, where's the best people, best place people can find you? Um, we are on all streaming platforms, uh, Spotify, Apple Music, can as Kenny and Claire, or you can just go to our website at KennyandClaire.com. And we're on uh, Facebook and Instagram, Instagram. YouTube, yeah. all the places. Yeah. Yes, yes. And uh, and you guys should definitely follow them. Yep. Go check them out on the streaming sites that you guys listen to because they're really, really talented. And we're so encouraged that they gave us their time today. Um, if you haven't already, make sure you go to impartial.com, sign up for our free weekly newsletter, maybe even support us on Kofi. We have a really fun campaign going on this Advent with um, a hymn a day. So follow us on Instagram for that. Uh, but until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Bye. Bye.